Welcome to the Ladysmith and District Historical Society's Historically Speaking talk series. My name is Quentin Goodbody, president of the Society. Our speaker tonight, Catherine Gilbert, is a Vancouver Island author, historian, and lecturer. She holds a master's degree in history in the public history stream from the University of Victoria, Vancouver Island. Catherine's books published to date include a Journey Back to Nature, the History of Strathcona Provincial Park, which was published earlier this year in time for the park's 110th anniversary. Another book she's published is called York Island and the Uncertain War, Defending Canada's Western Coast During World War II, which was published in 2012. Catherine also edited and did the layout for off the grid and on the edge, the history of Strathcona Park Lodge and Outdoor Education Center's 60th anniversary edition, written by Myrna Boulding, published in 2019. Catherine is also a fiction writer. Her short piece, I Married Lord Bacon, was published in Escape, an anthology for Northern Vancouver Island writers, published by Peregrine Press. Currently, Catherine's working on a book about David Garrick, one of the founders of Greenpeace. Catherine believes that history should be accessible to the public and told by the public. She's authored numerous articles and since 2002 has given many illustrated talks about the history of British Columbia. She acts as an historic interpreter for the museum at Campbell River and for various tour companies aboard boats to a variety of destinations on the coasts of Vancouver Island and the British Columbia mainland. We're very lucky tonight to have Catherine take us on a journey back to nature as she leads us through the fascinating history of Vancouver Island's beloved Strathcona Provincial Park. Catherine, the screen is yours. <laughs> thank you so much for that introduction and uh, thank you uh, especially for inviting me. So this is, a, I'm going to give a, a, make a quote from you. I, I imagine a number of you have heard of Roderick Haig Brown. Um, he's very celebrated here in Campbell River where his home uh, was, and it's now a heritage home that's looked after by the museum at Campbell River. And um, some people now consider him to be BC's father of environment. But he certainly, um, I think he would find that a funny label, but he was certainly a conservationist and uh, he had a great love for Strathcona Provincial Park. And he, he worked very hard during his lifetime to see that the park would be protected from any kind of industry. Um, he wasn't always successful, but he, he was very passionate of, in his love for this place. I am afraid, he said, for the wonderland of Strathcona Park, because its fate lies with a cabinet of dreary old men who have lost their capacity for wonder, if indeed they ever had any. A sense of place develops when you travel the roadways, fish the rivers, walk in the woods, and drink the waters of a special locality. And it's this sense of place that led me to write about Strathcona Provincial Park. I, I often get that question, uh, why did you choose to write about the park? Well, a, a lot of that had to do with um, simply working at Strathcona Park Lodge and Outdoor Education Center, which is next door to the park, roughly 10 kilometers away. And the park, uh, the lodge has used the park for a lot of its programs uh, since it started in outdoor education in the early 70s. Wallace Bakey wrote a history of Strathcona Provincial Park in 1988. And when I wrote that, read that, um, it really sparked an interest in the history of the park. I didn't realize what a unique history it had. Um, I, I love local history, the history of this region, uh, particularly the uh, North Central region of Vancouver Island, as well as the surrounding islands. And I helped Myrna Boulding, uh, who founded Strathcona Lodge with her late husband, Jim, to assemble the story of their lodge, which, which is really quite fascinating. It's been there for 60 years. Um, 
I connected with people who lived and worked at the lodge and were instrumental in making very significant changes in uh, the park, uh, protecting it for wilderness purposes. Um, there was Stephen Marlene Smith, Jim Rudder, Lindsay Elms and Philip Stone. Lindsay Elms and Philip Stone are both mountaineers who, who've written wonderful books about the park. And I worked at the museum at Campbell River when Philip Stone uh, had a, made a reenaction of the 1910 Ellison expedition into the park. So this was in 2010, a year before the park's 100th anniversary. So uh, he and a number of other people traced the steps of this first expedition into the park. And Philip and I talked about our mutual interest in the park's history. And this is where the park is located if you've never been there. Um, there are a couple of different ways to access it. Historically, the preferred way to access the park was Campbell River, even though the, there wasn't a road there. Uh, when they first got interested in the area, you had to get there by boat. Um, but you can also access the park going through Courtney um, and up the Mount Washington Road to uh, Paradise Meadows. And you can access the park through Port Alberni. So you can see it's almost directly or perfectly in the center of Vancouver Island. The First Nations history of Strathcona Provincial Park is a little bit scant. Um, this is something that I, I worked at um, sort of fixing or rectifying for this book because um, many, many people in particular, the supervisor of the park, Andy Smith, he said, you know, find out what, what do you know about the First Nations history? Find out everything you can. Well, it's not easy because um, it was never documented really by anyone. And there was no, no really no visual presence of First Nations people in the park. They, um, they had no village sites, although it's known that they certainly used the park. It was traditional territory. So specifically the, uh, the Nichatmos of the west coast of Vancouver Island and the Moshat Mushlet of today's uh, Gold River left signs of hunting there, of marmot and elk hunting. And they recently uh, were able to map out some of the trails that they used. Interestingly, those trails are actually uh, what the current highway is based on. Uh, the Western nations, these uh, the Nuchatno traded and sometimes warred with nations to the southeast of them, such as the Pentlach of uh, Comox Valley and the Alberni nations to the south, um, and the Coast Salish who occupied the Campbell River region until about 1850, and then the Lakewata, who are a Kwakwakwa nation. Uh, they came from Northern Vancouver Island and uh, they adopted the territory and used it for hunting as well. Now, what's interesting about the early explorers of the region long before it became a park was they were looking for minerals. Um, this would actually end up being a big point of contention throughout the park's history. But this is, this is what the mindset was in those years. Um, they, were, they were exploring the park after the gold rush, the famous gold rush of BC on the mainland. And it was still something that was high in people's minds. Uh, John Buttle, for whom Buttle Lake is named, uh, was an English geologist and botanist. So he explored and mapped the area in 1865. Uh, among the people in his group, um, there were prospectors who actually found gold on the Bedwell Valley during this excursion. Uh, next, there was the Reverend William Bolton, um, headmaster of Victoria University, uh, Victoria's University for Boys. And he organized a party to go through this region. Um, it, was, it was part of a trip that he was continuing. He'd been further north, but he, he made it very clear in his notes that he was hoping to discover gold and possibly copper in this region. Uh, later, Mike King, who was an American entrepreneur, and timber cruiser, he, ex he went back and forth through this region numerous times on foot following the trails that were already there. Um, although what's interesting is that some of the explorers such as Bolton uh, 
were, for some reason, couldn't find the trails. And it was very strange because they, I, it seems that they didn't consult with the First Nations people they met before they traversed the park. And they pretty much bushwhacked, whereas Mike King, um, I suppose he consulted with the, uh, the Indigenous people there and he, he found the trails and crossed the island numerous times. But one of his ideas was to develop this fantastic waterway that stretches from uh, Strathcona Park from Buttle Lake all the way to the ocean at Campbell River and exploit that for hydroelectric power, which, which eventually he did. So in the late 1800s, um, national parks were being established and um, throughout North America. So provincial leaders such as BC's Premier Richard McBride what was considering setting aside acreage on Vancouver Island for preservation as a natural space. He was actually getting pressure from groups such as the Natural History Society of, of BC, the Victoria Board of Trade, uh, the Victoria Tourist Association, and the Vancouver Island Development League to establish some kind of a park, whether it be provincial or national. So in 1910, he set aside about 250,000 uh, hectares um, in the center of Vancouver Island as a reserve. Now, um, in order to determine whether this reserve should be a park, the 1910 Ellison Expedition was begun. So this was under the leadership of Price Ellison, who was Minister of Lands in 1910. There were 23 people in the party, including Ellison's daughter, Myra, uh, William Bolton, who I mentioned earlier, who'd already been through the area, and a photographer, Frank Ward. So this is an example of one of Ward's photos, which are really tremendous. Um, they're housed in, in the museum at Campbell River, and um, they're, they're just, just, just stupendous photos. And um, Harry McClure Johnson kept a detailed journal now, Phil Stone, when he reenacted the expedition, um, he received permission from a, a, a relative of Johnson's to reproduce this journal. So you can actually purchase it from Phil Stone. And it's, it's really fascinating reading. So they set off by boat from Campbell River um, and went to, uh, from Victoria, sorry, um, went to Vancouver first and then to Campbell River. And then there was a rough road that they followed for about um, uh, 10, 11 kilometers. And then the rest of the way was by boat until they got to Buttle Lake and then they went back to the trails. So they stayed at the uh, Willows Hotel. Um, it was a, Campbell River in those days uh, was just a, a very much a fled, fledgling community. It was just a settlement. And there were only about 100 people there, but it had this fantastic hotel that was built by a couple of Swedish brothers, the two Lynn brothers. Um, they were banking on the fact that people would want to come, come to Campbell River to fish. It was already well known for its excellent salmon fishing. And um, Johnson wrote in the journal that they were astonished to find such a beautiful hotel in this tiny settlement that had hot running water. That, that was absolutely, it was just amazing to them. So they took the uh, wagon trail west and packed all their gear into a canoe and here they are pulling down the river. Now, um, oops, just missed that one. Let me go back one. Now the, um, the person who was their guide who they hired locally was quite a character. His name was uh, Lord Nathan Hugh Bacon. He called himself a Lord. Nobody was ever really sure that he was a lord. Um, and he lived in this cabin at Upper Campbell Lake, which was on the way to Buttle Lake. And he was a prospector and a trapper. Uh, he knew the area very well and proved to be absolutely invaluable. Um, and I, I just love Johnson's comments in his journal. He says, you know, he, Bacon was just so full of uh, nonsense and sense at the same time. You were never really sure if what he was telling you was true. But the fact of the matter is uh, they could not have done this trip without him. Uh, one funny thing about Bacon was that he had a dog he referred to as man. 
and he spoke to this dog all the time as if he was another human. So of course, man was on the trip with them. Now the group ended their expedition at Alberni, um, which is the other half of Port Alberni. It was just in those years, it was called Alberni from where they took a car to Nanaimo and then the train back to Victoria. And uh, Ellison wrote an absolutely glowing report of what they'd seen. So McBride said, you know, then um, I think this reserve that we set aside should be a park. So in 1911, um, it was established as British Columbia's first provincial park. And it was named after Lord Strathcona, who drove the last spike into the railway line that was going across Canada at that time. Now, one thing to keep in mind, or, or that's very important for the rest of this discussion, is that when this happened, there were already timber licenses within the park. Um, there were crown granted mineral claims. There was active mining development. And they, they said, well, this is going to be parkland with the idea that it was for the use of people like a wilderness park. But these things would come back to haunt the government and um, the conflict between the industry in the park and the idea that it was to be for people carried on throughout most of the park's history. One of the big challenges uh, with, with the park has been the fact that the Esquimalt and Nanaimo land grant was already surveyed before the park came into being. And it, it was always interesting for me working at Strathcona Lodge when people would say, well, I don't understand why they're logging in the park because today they don't. But the boundaries of the park are straight, are in straight lines. So they don't, it looks as if um, people are, like companies are actually logging within the park, but it's because the line goes halfway through, say, a hill or a mountain. And uh, one side is park and one side belongs to companies like Timberwest. And this was because when the ENN land grant was created, they drew, as you can see by the map, it's the mauve area. It was done with straight lines. And when you read surveyors' accounts of the work that they did, they said, we absolutely did everything in straight lines. Like we, we would cut down a tree so that we could go through a straight line. So there was never, never any, um, any sort of creative thinking. They, they just would, they would not even go around a tree, let alone any kind of a hill. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the grant, in 1883, Robert Dunsmuir contracted with the province to build a railway between Esquimalt and Nanaimo in exchange for 800,000 acres, as well as a cash grant of $750,000. Um, this, this was e scandalous, even in those days. And um, he, he uh, received all the mineral whites and timber whites for this vast, vast area. Um, it, it's just incredible to think of today. And it's, it's had a lot of repercussions uh, because they certainly didn't consult with First Nations people who were living within the grant area. So you can see that it, that grant uh, extends all the way from Victoria right up to Campbell River and adjacent to today's park. And this is a, an early map of the park from 1916 that shows you uh, where the ENN land grant borders on the park. So we have Buttle Lake and the problem here is that the um, the land grant line goes right through Buttle Lake. So Buttle, the whole of the lake was not included within the park. And this was to cause problems later on as well. And timber companies, uh, when they were able to buy bits of the grant as it was being sold off, would uh, log right up to the edge of the park. So people were very disturbed by this because it, it really does ruin the viewscape when, and, like even today, when you say clear cuts right up to the edge of the park. Now to, uh, to get the ball rolling, uh, McBride hired Reginald Thompson. And he was a, a very famous Seattle engineer who had mapped out Seattle and, and done some really in incredible things in that city. And in those days, um, there's, there was something called a utilitarian concept of, of parks. 
So it, what it meant was that um, they wanted it to be a beautiful wilderness park, but it also had to be made attractive to the kinds of people who could afford to go and visit that park. So they didn't think it was pretty enough for the general public. So they planted about 3000 trees, 10,000 plants, and that included Scotch broom. So you know, you know where that came from and about 4,000 pounds of seeds. They also thought that they should call the cougar population. Uh, they planned to harness hydroelectric power from the creeks at Butter Lake. They were going to build a golf course and a network of trails. Um, they also were hoping that the rail line um, that ended in Nanaimo and then later in Courtney would be extended all the way into Strathcona Park, but that didn't ever happen. They were planning to construct a road from Campbell River and erect two hotels to rival the Banff Springs um, because they, this, was, this was what the vision was. They wanted it to be another uh, Banff National Park. They wanted it to look like that. They just, they just felt that it, you know, people would come there in droves as long as there was a train to take them there. And this is a, a picture of Banff uh, the Banff Hotel to give you an idea and a picture of Strathcona Park about how they envisioned how this hotel would look in this beautiful wilderness area. So they began work on the road from Campbell River in 1912. And the, uh, the few people who managed to get to the park uh, via the road said that Buttle Lake just boiled with fish. In fact, in the Allison Party's journal, they said in one evening, they caught over 70 trout. If you can imagine, that doesn't happen today. Um, you're lucky to help, <laughs> you're lucky to catch a couple. Um, a, a couple of fellows, there were three brothers called the Sutherland brothers, kept a camp on Upper Campbell Lake. So they were, they were really busy when all of the surveying started and they started building the road because they would ferry supplies from Upper Campbell Lake to Buttle Lake, which was joined by the Campbell River. Uh, to all the gov government crews who were building roads. So by 1915, the road was completed to within about 20 kilometers of the park's entrance. And this is what the initial road looked like. Um, now, despite the growing interest, um, it, had, it had to stop because the world, the, it was the time of the First World War and funds were diverted away from the project um, there was a lack of manpower, crews were enlisted or conscripted, and um, they, the uh, leaders in Victoria made it very clear that they were going to, they just simply were not going to invest any more money into this road, and they had abandoned all ideas about making this park popular with people. They just, there just were no funds for it. Uh, now, Wallace Bakey, who I mentioned earlier, who wrote a history of the park, he traveled this road in um, a few years after it was constructed. And he said it was, it was wide, about 33 feet wide. And he also lamented that, he said, you know, there were these beautiful, enormous trees that they cut down in order to construct the road and they burned them. And he, he said, what a waste, like him being a logger, he just felt they could have done something, they could have sold that wood and maybe, you know, uh, they could have financed the road that way. So here's a picture of Wallace um, with his uh, bride-to-be in the middle and his sister. So in 1925, they went a hike into the park. Now, Myrna Bolding, um, who I mentioned as being the founder of Strathcona Park, um, was, grew up in the Comox Valley, but because her father loved that whole region, she often came to the park um, with her folks and, and their relatives who had cabins on Upper Campbell Lake. Now, here's, there's a funny story that um, the explorer Mike King met Myrna's grandmother when she was a baby at the Lorne Hotel in Comox. And he'd seen this beautiful falls at the south end of Buttle Lake. And he asked the parents permission if, if he could name the falls after her, after Myra. Um, but he didn't ever register the name. Now, the funny thing is when Price Ellison went through the same area, his daughter Myra was on the trip and he called the same falls Myra Falls. 
as well as the creek that fed into to the uh, falls. So the Myra, uh, the two different Myras had these one place named after them about 20 years apart. So it's kind of a funny, one of those very weird coincidences. They finally um, finished the road from Courtney to Campbell River in 1919. So it's interesting to note that while they were constructing the road to the park, people couldn't, still could not drive from Courtney to Campbell River. There was just a footpath. Um, now the road was described um, as seven miles. Uh, but it was bad and anyone going over it is doing so at the risk of broken springs. So you can see here's an example of try somebody trying to use this road into the park. Uh, someone in the Daily Colonist said, Colonist said only 11 miles of road are required to be constructed to allow automobiles to reach the end of Buttle Lake, which is in Strathcona Park. But it was um, it, it, a lot of different groups uh, went back and forth and pleaded with the government to continue the road, but it didn't happen. Um, so it's interesting to note that the way the way things occurred is is that the, these roads and this access to the park were never the result of the desire for tourism and, or to get the public there. It was it ended up being industry that allowed people in to park. The way this came about was that the Park Act was changed in 1927 to allow water levels to rise in parks watersheds, not just Strathcona, but other provincial parks. So in the 1940s, the BC Power Commission was planning a three dam project from Campbell River to Buttle Lake. Um, and so this road that everybody talked about for 40 years was finally finished in 1950 so that the Power Commission could determine if Buttle Lake was a suitable dam site. So the, the local governments and the provincial government had no interest in finishing the road, but the Power Commission ended up finishing the road. Now at this time, uh, Roderick K. Brown was really concerned about what was going to happen if the Power Commission went in there and put a dam in Buttle Lake. Um, he felt that the water level would rise uh, and then the, the fish wouldn't survive. Um, the old growth would be under water and it would spoil the beauty of Buttle Lake. He absolutely loved Buttle Lake. He had a friend who had a cabin um, on Buttle Lake, several cabins, William Reed, who was an American. He was educated in Alberta and the president of Ducks Unlimited. And he had purchased a mineral claim, with several buildings on the west side of, of Lake um, in 1936. He called it Nook Lodge. Now, strictly speaking, a person really couldn't live in the park. It was a provincial park, but there were many people who were squatters there. And um, Reed had purchased the mineral claim. And today, technically, you can't build a cabin or a structure on a mineral claim. Um, but he got away with it because he bought structures that were already in place. Uh, Reed supported Haig Brown in his, in his desire to protect Bottle Lake because Reed loved the lake as well and he didn't want to see it change. And they were really concerned about what would happen if the dam was put at the head of the lake. And Haig Brown uh, did not hesitate to express his views. He raised his concerns in newspapers and and this went on for five years, them fighting against the BC Power Commission. And, and this is a, a picture to show you what Buttle Lake looked like in those years. And Haig Brown said that it was the most beautiful lake he'd ever seen in his life. Uh, this is a picture of what a view from Upper Campbell Lake uh, into Buttle Lake, and it was joined by the, um, by the Campbell River at that time. So um, eventually when a dam was put in, it did certainly change the whole landscape. So even though they received a lot of support um, and there were many hunters and anglers groups and Comox Valley residents such as Ruth Masters um, and people who got together and didn't want to see this change, um, they, they weren't able to do anything about it. This battle went on for five years. 
Uh, but as it turned out, the commission realized that this, this spot they wanted to use uh, for a dam at the head of the lake wasn't going to work. So they decided instead to build the dam at the northeast side of Upper Campbell Lake. Um, and Haig Brown didn't really feel that he had won, even though they were moving the dam, because he realized that Buttle Lake, the water was still going to rise. And his daughter, Mary, remembered that they went up in uh, Reed's Plain before the valley was flooded. And uh, she said that her father, you know, after, after they flooded the lake, it, went, it rose by 18 feet. He was very depressed for about a year after. And this is showing you the whole system from Buttle Lake and all the way through the dam system to Campbell River. And it was important for the town of Campbell River because um, that was how they got a mill because now they could power a mill. And this is what it looked like when they constructed the dam at Upper Campbell Lake. Uh, Wallace Bakey knew about a beautiful lodge that was on the other side of the lake and before it was flooded, um, he bought it from the power commission. So what he did was he put logs underneath so that it would float across the lake and it did to the uh, other side to a property that he owned. And they, they uh, winched the building up to the top and this became the first Strathcona Park Lodge. So this is, um, this building unfortunately burned down in 1973, but this is the beginning of Strathcona Park Lodge and Outdoor Education Center. And in the 1960s, um, Myrna and her husband bought the property and the lodge and they turned it into guest accommodation. They, um, they, uh, Myrna always says that they stumbled into tourism because people would stop and wanted to stay at the lodge, whereas in fact, they were actually hoping to make it into a boys camp. But eventually they did turn it into an outdoor education center and, uh, and still school groups and people get trained there in outdoor education. And this is what the road looked like at the time. So her husband, Jim, was always, um, you, you know, lamenting and trying to get help with improving the road. Um, but again, it was industry that created a better road. There were mineral claims in Strathcona Park, as I mentioned before, and Western Mines had claims in the park and um, they were never able to develop them because this was a class A park. But a change was made in 1961 and they began purchasing uh, changes because the Minister of Recreation um, made it possible for anybody who had a claim within the park to develop it. And Western Mines went on in 1965 to start digging um, these huge open pit mines. And it was interesting that I heard an interview from a parks person who, who was going down the trail towards where they were digging out these pits. And he said, what are you doing? Like, you don't, you don't have any right to develop these parks, this, this mine here. And they said, yes, we do. And it was really interesting to find out that, that parks people were completely unaware of what was going on, that this came from higher levels of government than theirs. And people were very upset about it. They said, here you are entering Strathcona Park. There's no shooting or hunting, but you can have a mine within a park. And um, there, there were a lot of conflicting views about the park. Um, Haig Brown and Jim Bolding, um, you know, were really upset about it. And they had been lobbying the government for years to make, to improve the road and complete it into the park but it was only because of the mine being there that this road was ever finished. And some people in Campbell River thought it was great. The mine was going to uh, produce all kinds of economic benefit and give and make lots of um, jobs for people. But really for, for many people, they just said, you know, all these years we asked for a road into the park so we could use it for recreation, but it wasn't until the mine went in that they completed the road to the south end of the park and by 1966 that had even paved it. Now, one of the people who was for uh, development of the mines was Walter Guppy, who was a prospector from Tofino. 
And he said, if important mines are developed, there'll be points of interest such as Barkerville. He didn't appreciate the tourism potential of the park and felt that uh, people would not want to make an extended safari into the wilderness and that parks need to have picnic tables and garbage cans. So he, he thought that, um, he thought that uh, this, this wilderness was not going to bring people, but later uh, mountaineers certainly proved him wrong. Now, and a month after the mine opened, uh, Jim Bolding from the lodge and some friends went down to the mine site and they found this substance um, at the mouth of Myra Creek that came from the tailings. And they went down to Victoria and they were, they were protesting because um, they said, hey, th this mine's only been here for, for a couple of months and we already have this sludge, like Buttle Lake is being ruined. It was a pristine lake. And we're really concerned about the water because this, this is the water source for Campbell River as well as for the lodge and any properties along that road. Um, but just as a sort of a side note, at that same time, uh, Forbidden Plateau, uh, which is right beside Comox and Courtney, that was a popular skiing and hiking area was added to the park at that time. So we get some kind of good news and bad news in those days. Now, after the public protest, um, a, a biologist by the name of George Langford was sent down to investigate this pollution. And he said there should be a research station there and the water quality should be monitored. And they did so for several years, but what they noticed was metal levels in the lake were very high and they really didn't think that it was the tailings. They said tailings could not explain the increase in the metal. And they said there, there has to be some other reason. And, and they were well aware that it was dangerous because fish were dying. People were, were, uh, were um, who had been fishing in there for years were very well aware that the fish populations were going down drastically. And um, Clark said a pattern of high metal content shows a serious deterioration in the water color and the water um, quality. And he was very concerned. So they asked um, Tom Peterson, who just recently retired from UVic, um, to assess the effect of tailings going on. So I interviewed Peterson and he, he, said, um, he said he discovered that it was something called acid mine waste that was actually causing the problem. And that happens when you, op you dig an open pit mine and then all of these mineral, um, the ores are exposed to the elements and then they wash into the lake and they poison the lake and, and they were very concerned about it, but they were able to force uh, Westman Mines to clean it up. So today there's a process so that this doesn't happen any longer, but it did, it did permanent damage because um, they used to have a variety of trout in the lake called the Dolly Barden and they've never returned. Um, now, for more than a decade, um, Strathcona Park enjoyed protection from further resources extraction. So there was, um, when the NDP came in in 1972, they put a moratorium on mining in parks. Uh, but the problem was when the government changed again, and then in 1985, there was a new company called Cream Silver that wanted to develop their claims. And they were going. They were going to change everything to allow this new company to come in, even despite the fact that they were aware at this time of this acid mine waste and the pollution in Buttle Lake. Um, so some of the uh, the people who worked at Strathcona Park Lodge uh, got together and formed a group called the Friends of Strathcona Park, and they they got together with Jim Bolden to protest this new mine going into the park. These were all outdoor ed instructors. They were people who used Strathcona Lodge on a regular basis. They brought um, groups in, they brought children in to use the park and people lived on the lake and they were very concerned about the quality of the water and, and the quality of the park. They didn't want their wilderness park destroyed. Um, now, Jim Bolding was ill with pancreatic cancer, 
And uh, Rob Wood, who's a, a famous mountaineer in this area, was one of the people who started up the Friends of Strathcona Park with Steve and Marlene Smith. And um, they, uh, they had some help from Suzanne Lawson of Tofino, who had uh, been successful in stopping logging on Mears Island. And they formed the group. Um, they, they were able to receive a lot of support. And eventually there, a large protest was held in the park of a hundred people in the middle of the winter. And um, David Suzuki came, so he lent his star power. And um, finally, um, the BC parks decided that they had better form a committee and let people have their say. So it was the first time in the park's history that the public were actually uh, lent an ear so they, they could express how they felt about their park and express the fact that they felt their park should be for the people. It should be protected as wilderness. Um, now, the, the interesting thing was that the attitude at the time from, from the Ministry of Environment's point of view, they said that they felt parks should be open to um, exploitation if it was going to serve the economy of British Columbia. But this was the, um, the logo of the Friends of Strathcona Park, uh, don't cut the heart out of Strathcona Park. And uh, after they went through the protest and after the committee examined what everybody had to say, they completely changed it. And the good thing was um, they, they uh, put together a master plan for the park. So this, this would finally spell out the fact that industry did not really belong in parks. But it's, it's amazing to think that back in 1911, they, were, they wanted to create this wilderness park. It was a park for the people, but it wasn't until 1989 that they really put it into writing and that they finally, finally uh, BC Parks and the Ministry of Environment said, oh yeah, I guess the people are right. This is really what this park is supposed to be about. It's not about um, exploiting the minerals that are in the park. And, um, you know, the Cream Silver had a real problem with it. He said, he, they said, you know, it's, um, we, ha we have this mining claim and we have the right to develop it. And this is a picture of the, the area that they wanted to exploit this beautiful cream lake. So in the, um, the uh, one of the people who was involved in writing up this new report was Jim Rudder. And he said, the government had to be seen to be doing something about this. And uh, Ann Fittick and he were on something called a steering committee and they wrote the master plan. And Ann said that it was very painful because so many people had different interests. There was BC Hydro, Timber Tenures and the Mineral. And um, she and Jim Rudder, as well as uh, Peggy Carswell and a member of BC Parks uh, got together and wrote up the plan and it was finally finalized in 1993. Um, now, in 1990, the government was finally able to purchase all of the outstanding mining claims, as well as Walter Guppy's. And I found it really funny that uh, Guppy confessed. He said, I had always eked out a meager living as a miner and prospector, but the payout from the government buying out his claims, he said it set me up for life. It was a big break for me. But the, the master plan spelled out in clear language um, that the Ministry of the Environment, Lands and Parks objective was that they would, uh, the, the public would be allowed into their decision making. So the public could finally have a voice and say, you know, we don't think it's right to have a mine. And so they didn't. And, um, and they set up something called the Strathcona Park Public Advisory Committee that is still very active in communicating for the public and being a voice for the public with the Ministry of the Environment so that there's a constant communication now, uh, for example, between the existing mine and this advisory committee. 
So it was, it took a lot of effort. Um, it took people's, it took a lot of guts for people. They had to be very organized. They had to, um, they had to stage a huge protest in order to finally be heard. Because if, if they hadn't, this other mine would have gone ahead. And who knows how badly uh, Buttle Lake would have been polluted today if that had happened. Uh, another thing that happened was in 1995, the Strathcona Wilderness Institute was formed. And this is the picture of their visitor center at um, Paradise Meadows near Mount Washington. So they work with the friends of Strathcona Park and with BC Parks to educate the public about Strathcona Park. So it took, it took many years and a lot of effort until finally uh, Strathcona Park would become a place of education and wilderness that people could enjoy. And today thousands of visitors come to the park and they use the trails, they camp in the park. And it really is an outstanding place. It really is quite astonishing if you've never been there. It's, it's absolutely um, a gem and um, you know, if you have if you have an opportunity and you haven't been there, there there's so many trails to choose from, and it's just it's one of British Columbia's treasures. Mm -hmm.